Hi everybody, welcome to the channel. My name's Mike and I'm a journeyman beekeeper in North Carolina and we're going to talk about integrated pest management. Let's get into it. So what is integrative pest management? Integrative pest management is defined as the coordinated use of appropriate pest control tactics to reduce pests and their damage to an acceptable level. So for us as beekeepers, we're talking about a management system that will keep whatever pest we have, if it's small hive beetle, wax moth, varroa, to a manageable level that doesn't cause enough damage to our hives that it's going to eradicate them or we're going to have to step in and conduct treatments. An appropriate integrative pest management system are going to be your knowledge on the pests that are invading your hive. Do you know about their biology? Do you know about their life cycle? And do you know what they don't like? Um, what will keep them out of your hive? How did they get in there? The next thing you're going to want to do is monitor. Everything about an IPM is monitoring. So set up a schedule with your inspections that just cover monitoring where you're showing up and you have a couple things that you're looking for or you're doing some sort of test to find out what are my levels of pests today. Record keeping. Record keeping is very important to us as beekeepers because we want to keep track of our pest infestation. So that gives us a metrics. If you're keeping proper beekeeping notes and tracking and monitoring the amount of pests that you have in each of your hives, then you're going to be able to pinpoint exactly when did the pests get in there. And using your knowledge on life cycle, you're going to be able to figure out exactly how long you have until action needs to be taken, how long you have until it gets out of control. You're going to be armed with all the tools you need to keep your bees healthy because healthy bees are happy bees. How to set up an IPM that's best for you. How are you going to schedule out your monitoring? How are you going to figure out what pests are in there and how are you going to take action to minimize the amount of pests you have in your hive so that your hive stays healthy? Now, the first step is going to be pest biology. Can you identify the pest that's in there? Do you know the difference between a wax moth larva and a small hive beetle larva? When you're looking at pictures on Facebook or you're Googling it, they look very similar. But when you see them in real life, you're going to see wax moth larvae are much bigger than small hive beetle larvae. You're going to see that wax moth larvae creates webbing everywhere. And small hive beetle larvae, when they're in the honey super, will cause a, a sheen over everything. And it just looks slimy and gross. Uh, think Nickelodeon goo without the green. It's just transparent. That's the best way I can describe it. Might be showing my age. Now that you can identify the pest, do you know why the pest is in there? Small hive beetle typically goes after your honey crop. They're not really going in for your brood. So your honey crop may not be defended and they're just eating away and then causing the ugliness that small hive beetle larva does. And those that have had it know how gross it can really get in there. Wax moth larva, it's kind of in the name. Beekeeping is pretty easy. We try and keep the names very similar to what they go after. Small hive beetles look like small hive beetles. They're real small. Wax moth larvae, they eat wax. So they will tunnel through your wax and you'll see when you're looking at a frame, these tunnels, and then you'll see all this webbing everywhere and you'll see cocoons uh, burrowed into the wood or yeah, the wood frames or the hive box. They typically like to make cocoons in corners. 
these are kind of things that you would need to be able to identify and figure out, well, what stage are we in? Are we still in the, hey, we got one or two larvae making tunnels, or do we have thousands of larvae in there and we have cocoons and actual moths running around your hive? Monitoring your pest. Now that you've identified it, let's monitor it. Let's figure out where we are. You want to know uh, the identifiers for Varroa. You want to know the identifiers for small hive beetle and the identifiers for wax moth or any other pest, a, a mouse in there or a snake. Doesn't occur in our hives too often, so I can't really speak to mice or snakes. Our snakes in this area are big. They're not going to fit through my three, four size uh, entrance. But methods of control. Do you know how they get in? Are they coming right in through the front door? Or does your hive have cracks near the the seams? Are the uh, hive boxes uneven on there so the bees aren't even propolizing it? They're using the, the side of the hive as an entrance exit. Something else is also using the side as an entrance exit, and that's going to be your pests. So we'll cover what we do when we discover that maybe I made a hive box that's a little wonky. How do we fix that? How do we help the bees fix that and entice them to propolize those, those little areas? We want to be able to set a threshold and we'll get into what is a threshold? What does it mean? There is the Bee Informed Partnership that sets their annual thresholds trying to help beekeepers and just give them a, a number. So when you do like a sugar shake, if you have, you know, more than a certain amount of or a certain percentage of mites coming out of your 100 uh, bees, what, what does that mean? Are you over a threshold? Are you below the threshold? Do you need to treat? Where are we at? So Bee Informed Partnership tries to hook you up that way. Most of the beekeeping clubs follow that. In, in North Carolina at the conferences, we're always talking about Varroa and what the threshold level is this year. So something to definitely pay attention to. Methods of control, we'll talk about the different uh, action items you can take before putting pesticides in your hive. These are things that just deter pests from even coming into your hive and gives your bees a chance to defend the hive properly. Uh, there are going to be some hives that are more defensive when it comes to pests trying to get in and some that just let them walk right in. Uh, that's out of your control. What you're trying to do is set the bees up for success. That's what we're going to talk about today. Monitoring is finding out how much of a pest you have, what the quantity of your pest is in the hive. Recording your notes is writing it down. Control is the actions you take before treatment. Once you're over your threshold, you treat, and then you're going to monitor again and take notes again. So just keep that in mind. It's a never-ending process until winter, really, of monitoring and taking care of the bees. Because what we want is healthy bees at the end of the day. Uh, it, if your goals are a little different, you're like, I just want as much honey as I can get. Well, what about next year? Are you still going to have bees next year to produce those that amount of honey? Or are you setting aside a fund to continually buy bees? Here at Rascal Apiary, we haven't bought bees in four, four years now. So we're very proficient at keeping our bees healthy, keeping them alive. We kind of look at honey and everything else as secondary. So selling the bees... Uh, selling honey, getting wax products. Those are all kind of secondary for us right now. Um, as, as we become more and more proficient and we start entering master beekeeper territory, we're going to start trying to see if we can do both, keep the bees alive for a long time and produce, you know, all this extra income from honey or uh, wax products, making mead, that sort of thing. But I know beginner beekeepers, you hear that and you go, yeah, I, I got the bees for the honey. And I understand that. But let's uh, continue on with IPM. We're going to focus on small hive beetle and varroa today. Small hive beetle, 
their life cycle it's fairly simple they're going to smell the hive and then they're going to enter the hive basically through the front door if you have other cracks and crevices they will find those and enter that way uh, the female hive beetle is going to enter the hive and then she's going to find you know this the small spaces the ones in between the frame rests the ones up in the corners uh, of the hive box they're going to find empty cells that haven't been filled with anything yet and they're going to lay eggs they're going to lay a lot of eggs um two to four days after that occurs they're going the eggs are going to hatch so eggs hatch remember that and then the larva is going to feed on what's in the hive that they can get at if if it's near pollen they're going to eat the pollen if it's near uh honey they're going to eat that sometimes they dip into the the, the eggs in the brood but um I, I mainly see them up in the honey super and in the uh, resource pattern of the the brood's nest and they're just eating away causing devastation after that they'll do that for a couple of days somewhere between day seven and ten of them being uh them existing they will exit the hive and typically they exit the hive just like the bees do so if, if the bees are coming in and out through the front entrance that's how they're going to do they're going to drop off of the ledge um the landing board into the ground they're going to dig about four inches down and then they're going to pupate and become a hive beetle so we'll we'll talk about what to do about all this in a minute but we're trying to get it through to you what's the life cycle that way you understand what's going on varroa mite their life cycle is find a honeybee that that's working that's foraging the fields they're going to hop on because they're a parasite they're going to ride that bee into the hive and then they're going to basically hop bee to bee because your forager bees coming landing on the landing board maybe walking in a couple of steps and then uh essentially regurgitating or passing the nectar from their honey stomach to another bee's honey stomach and that bee's going to go uh, store it somewhere so they may end up dropping onto a uh, onto the landing board they may end up just hopping over to another honeybee but keep in mind it's a mite parasitic mite and they're just going to have their arms up ready to go kind of if you look at videos of ticks in the woods they they sit on leaves and um, grass leaves trees they'll fall off of them but uh, basically they have their arms sticking up and they're just waiting for something to walk by brush against them and they'll grab on so that's uh basically how the varroa go ahead and jump from b to b until they're uh, near the brood's nest they're going to drop down where the eggs are where the larva is and they're going to start laying eggs now where do they lay eggs they're not going to lay it right on top of the larva they're going to lay under the larva and then as as you may know well under the larva is food there there's like a um, a layer of liquid there what varroa do is they have a telescopic kind of mouth i think that's the best way to to put it or air tube air tubes probably more easy to understand so if you think of a submarine and it's got a periscope that comes up to go above the water that's what the mite is doing it's gonna shoot up its air tube so it can still breathe but it's going to be down in the actual food so when you're looking in in your uh in your frames into the cells there's a good chance you're not even going to see the varroa you're not going to see how much uh infestation you actually have at that point but the female varroa will go under it's going to start laying eggs in the actual feed the eggs will then uh hatch and the baby mites will start feeding on the food that's in there it'll feed on the larva uh that's that's in the cell the bee larva it's going to attach to the bee start feeding off of the bee and then it's as the bee goes from larva to pupae to actual bee bee's going to crawl out and now it's covered in a couple of different mites and those mites will then if they're female they'll drop off into other cells if not they'll just keep sucking on the bee and then riding it um through the bee's life cycle essentially 
We don't want to get to the point where we have infestation. The word infestation just kind of like every every crevice and every uh, part of the hive box is just crawling with something other than a bee. That's what I think of. But uh, in reality, it, it's almost you can't even see that there's an infestation going on uh, for the most part when it comes to Varroa. There are signs, and we'll talk about those, that you can see on the actual bees. But once you start seeing Varroa physically on the bee, you, you, got, you have an infestation. Just imagine like that whole hive is just bursting at the seams with Varroa. A small hive beetle, one of the, the big signs is seeing the actual larva just eating away at everything. Um, that's going to happen in your, your honey super for the most part or any part of the resource pattern of your brood's nest. So what do you do? How do you monitor for small hive beetle? The first thing is when you're doing a basic inspection and you take off the lids, the outer cover, flip it over. Don't just throw it on the ground. Flip it over, look at it. And if you see small hive beetles running for the corners, trying to get away from the sun, um, you know that you have small hive beetles in there and you need to start taking some control measures to make sure that limit stays below your threshold. Uh, check the inner cover as well. There's always nooks and crannies in the inner cover that will try the small hive beetle will try and hide in. Uh, other things that, that you may see are spiders in there. They'll eat the small hive beetles. Sometimes they're good, but they also eat the honeybees. So sometimes they're bad. Uh, like we have here, the honeybees will force the small hive beetles to move into those crevices. The guard bees. Most of the time they're outside the hive guarding the entrance, right? But these bees will actually detain the small hive beetles in corners and keep them there so that they're not eating the resources because the honeybees can't actually uh, kill a small hive beetle in beetle form. The exoskeleton of the small hive beetle is too hard. Uh, to try and flip over the small hive beetle is very difficult for the honeybee. So they're not able to bite or sting the uh, small hive beetle and do any real damage that uh, U.S. beekeeper could do. Varroa, some of the techniques you can use to monitor what's going on is a corrugated board for your IPM, also called a sticky board if you hear that. And that looks like this. Typically it has a grid on it. Um, you'll hear of beekeepers grabbing the uh, political signs and using those. They're about the same size as these uh, IPM boards, but these are kind of the official one. They're in grids. And what you do is you'll put something uh, on here. If it's a vegetable oil or just something sticky to this board, and then you're going to slide it under your hive and let it sit there for three days. And then you're going to pull it out. And what you're going to do is in each of these boxes, you're going to count the amount of dead Varroa that's on there. And then you're going to divide by three and you'll know your drop count for each day. Now that kind of gives you some assistance to figuring out your threshold, how many Varroa are falling off. But then we have to look at the life cycle of the, of the Varroa and go, well, if these guys are already falling off dying, how long has it been since, you know, the first eggs were laid by the first female Varroa that entered your hive? And then you can almost go, well, that's been two, three weeks. So if this is my, my might drop count for day three today, then we really started two weeks ago with having maybe an issue, maybe not. If you only have one or two that, that drop down, you're doing good. But keep in mind, you're, you're counting two weeks behind, okay? Uh, another one you could do is a sugar shake. This is what we do primarily, and it's and we have a video on it. You're basically taking a half cup of bees, you're putting sugar on them, shake them up real good. The sugar will cause the mites to drop off of the bees. These are nurse bees, so they're the ones walking over the, the cells. But this will cause the varroa to fall off, and then what you're going to do is turn over that, that jar and shake all the powder sugar onto this, the, the varroa will fall with it, and then you're gonna spray it with water 
that dissolves the sugar and then just leaves you the varroa that's sitting in the water. And then you can just count them that way. And that will tell you how many varroa you have on your nurse bees. That's, that's a wonderful way to check. Uh, it's more accurate than this, the sticky board or corrugated board. Less accurate than an alcohol wash. Alcohol wash is very similar to a sugar shake, except for you're killing the bees by putting alcohol in there. You're also killing the mites. And then all you're doing is removing the, the bees. Actually, you're, you're just pouring the alcohol into a container or bowl, and then you're going to count the mites. Same sort of uh, technique, just in one aspect, the bees are alive. They're just covered in, in sugar and they're cleaning each other off. They may be a little agitated. In the other case, your bees are dead. But killing 300 bees in a hive that consistently has, you know, 100,000, we're not really doing a ton of damage. Um, if you're doing it in, uh, monitoring every two, three weeks, it, it's not doing enough to, to take out the hive. And then I have drone comb check. What I mean by that is I will take uh, one of our green frames that has nothing but drone, drone comb in it, which has drone brood in it. Um, and I'll just take that whole thing out, replace it with another uh, frame of wax. And then I'm going to go through a majority of those, cut open the top of the brood um, cappings, pull out the drones and see how many varroa I have crawling around on those drones. If it's an abundance, then I know that, hey, I can stick this frame into the freezer. That's going to kill all the drones, but it's also going to kill all the mites. And then I can stick it back in a strong hive and the bees will pull out all of those drones and then the queen will lay again. And I can find out uh, again in another couple of weeks how many or how much Varroa infestation I have on my uh, my drone comb. Problem with that is if you forget. If you're like me and get deployed in the military a lot, I put that frame in there, I left, came back four weeks later, a month, all the drones had emerged, and now I had a case of maybe Varroa everywhere, but I wasn't able to monitor. So I did a sugar shake, I checked it out, Levels were still low, which that's good, but levels being low and then I can carry on with my IPM. I don't have to worry about treatments yet. I've been talking about threshold this whole time, trying to instill that you have to set a limit for where you're going to start conducting treatments. Where did your controls uh, stop becoming effective? and you now have to do a treatment to, to kill off the Varroa or the small hive beetle. So I got this chart, it's from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, and what it talks about is number of pests over time. There's a lot of charts out here that will show the Varroa uh, pest over time. I like those charts, but this one covers all your pests, essentially. It's very generic and basic. Um, you're going to see that your pests start out at a low level, and then as it climbs, you have to set the point of, if I get this, these many Varroa in a drop count, in a sugar shake, um, or whatever method you're using, that's when I'm going to start treatments. Same thing with small high beetles. If I start seeing 10, 20, 30 in there, where's my limit before I, I start taking drastic measures? Um, and what EIL is, is economic injury level and that's at what point are are you thinking you're going to lose the hive if this carries on past this point you're kind of in a state of my population of my bees is going to decline rapidly uh there's no more wax left there's no place for the queen to lay you know that there's a lot of bad things that happen and then you don't have a hive anymore and, you, and you're wondering what happened um the point of doing treatments is when it gets up to the ET, which is economic threshold, that's where you cross that line and damage to your hive is imminent and you need to take action. Uh, and then your control is everything you do prior to reaching that, that ET, your economic threshold. So as, as you reach that ET level, the economic threshold level, 
that's just showing that damage is imminent to your hive. That means that the pest level has gotten to a point where if you don't take control of it, it's going to destroy your whole hive. And then controls are actions that you took prior to doing a treatment. If that means um, putting your, your hive in full sun or what, whatever environment you set up to help out the bees, that's, that's your control. And then your treatments are later on. So controlling strategies for small hive beetle, pretty easy. Any, any spot on the hive that's not the main entrance that you want them to use that is maybe accidental crack that the bees are coming in and out or you get some warping in the wood and it starts to separate, go ahead and use painter's tape. Tape that whole section off. And then the bees, what they will do is because they can't come in and out of there, they will propolize it. They will also propolize it and that will trap the small hive beetles effectively on the outside of the hive because now they've kind of walled up that crack. Um, you want to reduce the hive's main entrance. And what I'm talking about there is if you have the main entrance completely open because you were told, hey, it's that time of year, there's a lot of foraging going on and they need that whole front door open. If it's like a nine to 10 inches open, but you're getting pests in, you need to take some actions to close that down a little bit. Help the guard bees actually defend the entrance. So what I'm talking about there is we'll go from maybe a two or three inch opening down to a three fourths inch opening. And we'll do that for a couple of days, letting the bees um, guard that entrance. And then we'll figure out, well, they need more ventilation. What do we do? We'll add some, some shims in between each box and just do a three fourths entrance there. That way, there's a three-fourths entrance here, up here, up there, and maybe even at the top. And that'll help with ventilation. If you have a screen bottom board, you just take that board out and let them have at it. That will keep most of the pests out from entering the bottom still because of the hardware cloth. And then uh, anything that's inside and the bees are knocking off the frames, they'll just fall right through. Some of the other things we do for small hive beetles is we'll put these beetle traps in. I really like these guys, they're cheap, um, disposable, and you just put a little bit of liquid down in here, uh, typically some sort of vegetable oil. Fill that up a third of the way, and then the bees will chase the hive beetles into the top here, and they'll drown in the, the oil. So you'll see these fill up with small hive beetles if you got a real big problem. But I'll put this in as a control measure. I'll put one or two in at the top, in the top box, and then I'll leave it there and I'll just take it out, take a look. If there's nothing in there, okay. But I'm also checking the outer cover, the inner cover, making sure that they're not just being chased into those corners and not the beetle trap. There are plenty of other beetle traps out there. That's just the one I like. Check the outer cover, the inner cover. Go ahead and destroy those, those hive beetles. Um, the bees typically will trap them in the corner. So try not to destroy the bee at the same time, but Use your hive tool, smash them. You can use your finger, smash them. It doesn't really matter. Another controlling strategy that, that's not on here that you could do is setting nematodes in the ground. There are some beekeepers that will sell nematodes. They'll raise them, sell them. Uh, we don't use them. What we do is we have chickens. We raise our hives up. We let the chickens eat everything out of the ground around it. They'll scratch up everything. They'll keep the soil nice and loose. Uh, which helps the larva actually get down that those four inches, but the chickens will eat up the larva before they even get a chance to dig down. Other things that, that folks have done is laid in gravel, clay, and other things, but really all that's doing is the larva will drop off and then they're going to crawl until they find a, a piece of land that they can then dig in and pupate. So you're kind of you're kind of using a control strategy there. I don't know how effective it is, if you have the clay and then you have chickens and they come and, and they can grab the, the larva before they reach the, the prime pupating spot, then yeah, that's, that's effective. But just letting the, the, the larva crawl across your clay or, you know, gravel, I, I don't think you're really doing a whole lot there. If you do all your control strategies that you can think of, but you still have an influx of hive beetle, consider moving your hive into full sun. Something in the environment that, that you have set up is allowing the, 
the hive beetles to come in. If, if that's being under a, a tree or on top of a really loose soil, something there is not quite right and you should consider moving your bees to a, a sunnier spot uh, where they can at least get hit by the sun for six to eight hours during the day. And the last one is if your trap's not working, put in a different kind of trap. There's all different kinds from Swiffer pads to CD cases, beetle blasters, better beetle blasters, beetle jails, all sorts of different products that you can buy that will help capture these beetles. Uh, ensure that you're using the trap properly as well. Read the label, look at videos and what people do, and then uh, go from there because there, there are times that you think, hey, this is just trap. He said put it in the top box. Maybe you didn't put it in the right spot. Um, I did end up putting this on one of the outsides where this lip was sitting on the actual hive box and this lip was on a frame. And what that did is it created a, a maybe less than a millimeter of space between the two boxes and it rained and some water got in. And that caused mold, which caused a whole slew of other problems in there until I realized, oh, why is my beetle blaster full of water? Well, that I put it on the outside of the box and just let water fill it up and then oil got everywhere too. So ensure you're using your traps correctly. For Varroa, some of the things we do, and, and it's a constant process, you have to be proactive and just keep using your control methods. One of the things that we do is we give the queen a one to two uh, week brood break and we'll put a little cage around her um, it's like a hardware cloth and we'll just find her and we'll stick her in a maybe a four by four area four inches by four inches and once she's laid there she's not allowed to go anywhere else we've done that we've done splits to try and move her into a one or two frame hive and then let that hive create a brand new queen and then during that time it gives them a, a pretty long brood break and that can knock down your, your Varroa population. These are not effective if you already have an infestation. Okay, these are before the infestation arrives. And the whole point of it is to keep that population be below the economic threshold for you. And if you can do that the entire year without doing treatments, good on you. We remove the drone comb like I talked about, take that green frame out, Go ahead and take a look, see how many drones have Varroa on it, freeze the frame, put the frame back after it's thawed, put it back, and let the bees take all those drones out, move them out. It gives the bees something to do too. We will simulate a swarm, which is kind of like the split. We will requeen if we have to. We typically don't. We just try and do the brood break. If we need to requeen, then, then we will, of course, but we haven't had to in two years. Full sun. Now... We only kind of came up with the full sun because I kept going to these conferences and there was always somebody trying to sell essentially a bottom board that has a hot plate in it. And what it does is it heats it up to a temperature where the Varroa can't survive, but the bees will. And I, I'm sure that that's got to be harsh on the bees, but we put the hives in, in full sun uh, for the most part and that that's been mildly effective to, to knocking off Varroa. What it, what it can do as well is make your queen less reproductive. Uh, the heat will actually kill the spermicide that's in your queen, and she may only last maybe a year or two before they replace her, versus the, the old school where you could have a queen for eight years in one hive. Um, that, with putting them in full sun, that kind of goes away heated bottom board gadgets that's what i was just talking about you can look them up online there's there's a bunch of them out there that you're supposed to put them under it's not really for winter it's supposed to be to kill the varroa and, and keep keep them knocked down we're talking about things that you do prior to having an infestation so there's a lot of things out there that will help you monitor as well passively without you actually getting in there i find that those are they're okay, but you still need to get in there and do your active monitoring. Find out exactly how much you have. Reaching your threshold. So once you've set your threshold of how many small hive beetles you're 
you're for sure that you're going to have in your hive before you're like, I'm taking action. Once you've reached that level, start removing your honey supers. If they're completely infested with small hive beetles, stick them in the freezer or deep freezer. And then uh, you want to somehow increase the amount of honeybees that are in that hive because they're just not defending the hive properly because you've already, should have already put in different kinds of traps to try and keep them under control, closed off all the extra entrances. So really the only way that these hive beetles are getting in and out is through the front door. And if that's the case, then the, the bees need to be enticed to keep them out, you know. So what you're doing is you're going to remove your honey supers, freeze them, that will kill your small hive beetle problem, and pretty much makes your honey not usable at that point. I, I would not suggest trying to harvest that honey at all. For Varroa, next thing you, you need to do is if you reach your threshold is look at a pesticide. In the beekeeping world, all the pesticides are called treatments. All the treatments are miticides. They kill the mites. Very uh, stressful on the, the hive, but they're already under stress because of the Varroa. The Varroa are uh, there. They're infesting your hive, and th through them being a parasite, they're also making your bees more susceptible to just random diseases. Uh, if you got, you know, a deformed wing virus in there, you'll see that on the bees before you see the varroa. K-wing, um, that's a sign of stress that the bees are going through. You'll see many other uh, signs of disease and illness in the hive from the bees before you ever see the varroa on the back of a bee. So keep that in mind. Examples of treatments, and um, I'm gonna let you know, go into a big box store and try and pick up a, a pesticide is not the answer. You wanna find one that's specific for varroa, specific to being placed in a beehive. So read the label, know what product you're using, don't willy-nilly buy anything and put it in your hive, okay? There are some of these that are listed that are going to be okay for having a honey super on and some that are not. Uh, some that are gas and some that are just acid. Some that the bees walk on, some that you have to drip. Read the label. In, in the U.S. it's law. Label is law, okay? So if you use it in some other way than the label says, illegal. That's illegal. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it, no gray area. But some of the active ingredients are going to be oxalic acid, thymol, hot beta acids, and formic acids. There's a couple more out there, but those are the big guys. They come in different uh, percentages per what product you buy. So over, read the label, follow the instructions. If something doesn't make sense, feel free to call the company. They will help you. We've called the uh, formic acid guys before and they were very friendly the lady on the phone walked us through everything basically read us what the label said and then we asked some more questions just because the temperatures were a little off here than what the label said and she said she did not advise us putting it in so we waited and then put it in later but got to read the label guys okay the next thing is you you set your your economic threshold you went over it uh, the pests went over it, and then you treated. Now what do you do? And guys, how do you know if it was effective? How do you know if your treatment that you put in there actually did anything? Now, for either small hive beetles or varroa, you're going to monitor your pest levels again. Go and do a check. Look in there. Check all the crevices. See if there's any larva crawling around. For Varroa, you're going to do the same sort of thing, but it's going to be a sugar shake, alcohol wash, a drop check. Uh, mite drop count is so simple that you could do both. Put in your board for two, three days, take it out, do your count, come out, do a sugar shake, check that, compare the two numbers, and go, okay, so on my, my mite count, I only got a couple, but in my sugar shake, I had, you know, over 5%. That's not okay. So that means we need to, we're still over our threshold. Let's get a different treatment and treat.
or let's treat again with the same thing, but then do your mic check again. Record, record, record. I don't know how many times you go and talk to a beginner beekeeper and you go, hey, did you do a treatment this year? Did you check for mites? Yes, I did a sugar shake. Well, how many mites do you have? Uh, I knew then, I don't know now. So you did a treatment. Yep. Did you check after? I totally checked after and I was, you know, below 3%. Okay. Did you write it down anywhere? No. How are you going to know for next year? You want to set historical information in place so that next year when you go back and look, you can go in July, August, September, I was good. Zero, zero across the board or 1% across the board. But then late October hit and I'm at 10, 12, 13% mite load or small hive beetles just invaded my hives. You're going to want to know that last year's data is going to show you what this year could look like and what next year may look like. Now, a lot of it for small hive beetles, weather dependent, if it heats up during the winter and these small hive beetles start coming up out of the ground and then it freezes again, you can almost look at that and go, okay, next year, we're not going to have a whole lot of small hive beetles. But Varroa wise, it kind of gives you a, a point where you can look at it and go, they're migrating to my hives at this time of year. And it's always early October or it's always right in September, or it's always August, and it's been like that for five years, let's go ahead and make sure we're ready to take action at that time. Let's make sure we close up the hive a little bit at that time. Always be proactive. Proactive breeds healthy bees. Just remember that. Keep your notes. Review your notes. Always look at last year. When you treat with pesticide, always read the label. And then monitor again. Once you monitor, if you're below your threshold and you feel comfortable that your bees are healthy bees, then continue to monitor after that to ensure that they're healthy. Now, once it starts getting into winter and it's too cold to, to monitor or do hive inspections, you got to cross your fingers and hope that when January, February, March starts showing up, in, in our area, it's uh, late March is when you can start doing inspections again. But late January and early February is when the queen starts laying. So you got to cross your fingers and hope that they survive until then. They're not going to starve. No pest really ran them out of the hive or killed them. And that you're ready to do beekeeping again. Because the whole point of this is just to keep that cycle going. If you really enjoy beekeeping, do the right thing and help out your hives, you know. And it's not just setting up an IPM. It doesn't take very long. You can just Jot it down on a piece of paper during this video. Hey, this is the level uh, Be Informed Partnership thinks it should be. This is the level I want it to be. This is the type of treatment I want to use. And, and another note on the treatment, and I might have mentioned it already, but if you treat with one product and it's not effective, treat with a different product. If you're treating with one product this year and it's very effective, next year change to a different product because you don't want the mites to adapt to what you're doing. If you're using Formic Pro every single year, check your notes. First year might have been really good. Second year, not so good. Third year, ineffective. Fourth year, why are we still even trying in fourth year if it was ineffective in the third year? So what we do is we go from Formic Pro to HopGuard, back to Formic Pro, and then we're thinking about doing oxalic acid next year, but that's just something that uh, we have to talk about before we, we just buy it and go out and start doing it. There's different ways of putting oxalic acid in your hive, and we're not sure we really want to do it. But be proactive, guys, and leave, leave me uh, notes in the comments. Like, let me know what you do. How do you keep your notes? You just write on top of the hive? Do you do it electronically? How, how do you have your IPM set up? Did I miss something completely that you do that you're like, if everybody did this, we'd all be happy. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed our IPM video. Leave us a comment, hit subscribe, like. Go over to our website, rascalapiary.com. We have other supplemental articles there that will help you learn a little bit about bees during the winter here. And thanks for watching.
A special thank you to Carol J. Thanks for helping out the bees. And if you too want to donate, head over to Rascal Apiary and hit that donate button. Thanks everybody. Healthy bees are happy bees.